Okay, well, let's begin. So welcome everybody to the uh, United States Geological Survey and Geoscience Australia uh, Earth Observation Data Science Seminar. Uh, today we've got uh, a range of presentations from the USGS and from GA. Um, my name is Alex Leith. I work at Geoscience Australia in uh, Digital Earth Australia, where we organise uh, vast quantities of Earth observation data to enable uh, science and industry to build applications on top of it. Um, I'm going to stay out of your way, though. We've got six great presentations. Uh, first up, though, we've got uh, Pete Duchette and David Gavin, who are going to give a brief intro to things. And at the end, we're going to have a Q&A where we um, do a kind of session and uh, open the floor to audience questions. Each presentation will be around 10 minutes long with an opportunity for direct questions to that presenter immediately afterwards. Uh, and without further ado, let's move on. So first up, we've got Pete. Okay, thank you, Alex. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and turn off my, my video here just to cut down on distractions. So uh, I'm Pete Doucette. I'm the lead of the uh, Science and Applications branch at USGS Eros. I'd like to express my thanks to the organizers for allowing me a few minutes to open this, uh, this webinar on Open Data Cube. So turning to my slide, I've only got the one slide. It's been said that data is the new oil, which is an analogy some have taken exceptions to. But if you think about it, in a sense, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, et cetera, are the new titans of the 21st century rivaling the 20th century oil titans such as Exxon, Shell, and BP. So taking this oil analogy a step further, unrefined data, just as unrefined crude oil, is far less useful. And, and as an, an aside, it would be an interesting uh, uh, thought experiment to speculate on on data company analogies to Exxon, the Exxon Valdez or Deepwater Horizon, you know, certainly Facebook comes to mind, but we won't go there. So getting back to the idea of unrefined data, right? that takes us to this Venn diagram here in the middle of, of the chart. So where data science is the engine that demands to be fueled from the data refinement process. right? There are many variation of, variations of this graphic so I created my own here to avoid copyright, but they all generally capture the same idea of overlapping components coming together to give rise to data science here as you see it. Uh, so the more traditional components as we know are, are uh, domain knowledge in the orange circle, which are the disciplines such as forestry, landscape, ecology, geology, et cetera. And then maths, uh, statistics, and physics in the purple circle. And of course, the faster evolving component is the computer science, AI, ML, cloud, HPC, in the green circle. So to tell the truth, uh, data science is hardly a new concept, but rather more about new packaging. In fact, the statistics community in, in the purple circle took some exception a few years ago to this new packaging, claiming their field was being co-opted by data science. But in any event, it would seem that this label is, is probably going to be around with us for a while. So you see on the left here of the Venn diagram, uh, we see examples of data refinement labels, right, that have emerged in the vernacular. We're all becoming accustomed to seeing data conditioning, calibration, harmonization, and the crowd favorite analysis ready data, right? Uh, uh, next, please. So you hear, here you see on the right side of the Venn diagram examples of combustion, right, continuing with our oil analogy or the utility of the refined data, such as analytics, modeling, inference, and projection, right? So what's needed to drive data science in this 21st century era are the right computational engines to consume the data efficiently. So there you see at the bottom, I'm defining these as data science constructs. So Open Data Cube is a data science construct, as I defined it here which is of course the theme of this webinar. So over the next couple of hours, you'll be hearing from several senior scientists from USGS and GA about the kinds of products that have definite needs for data science constructs, such as Open Data Cube. So on behalf of our USGS and GA organizers and speakers, we thank you for your attendance, and I hope this marks a strong beginning for ODC for our community. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. 
to David. Yep, Dave. I just need you to, there we go. All right. All right. Good evening and good morning. My name is David Gavin. I'm the Director of Technologies for Digital Earth Australia. This is hopefully a succinct introduction on the Open Data Cube software that will feature heavily in some of our presentations to you today. The Open Data Cube was designed as an open source Python library for data scientists who intuitively explore over 30 years of Landsat imagery. The goal of this software is to enable users to stream temporarily rich stacked grids of data into memory where users can then manipulate data further using tools like NumPy and Dask. Individual file access in, is invisible to the user, with decisions on the most efficient means to load and reproject data being made by the Open Data Cube. An Open Data Cube installation has three components, a collection of gridded data sets or GDAL compatible files, accessible either locally or streamed over the internet, a Postgres database containing an index of the searchable metadata of your imagery, a Python collection with the open, a Python environment with the Open Data Cube core library installed, including Python modules such as XArray, NumPy, Dask, and Raster.io. Today, Open Data Cube works with data from a growing variety of satellites and sources. It powers web mapping tools, online Jupyter notebook environments, and the development of new remote sensing insights, some of which you will hear about now from our esteemed speakers. If you want to find out more about the Open Data Cube, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Alex Lees. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy your webinar. Ooh, there's a journal. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, and that brings us to the end of the introductory sort of session. So hopefully the scene is set. We want to talk about data science and how we're um, how the availability of analysis ready data is making uh, different kinds of uh, different ways of doing science um, possible. Um, and look, I'd like to hand over to the first presenter now, uh, Belle Tisso from Geoscience Australia, who's going to talk about land cover classification and change mapping at scale. So over to you, Belle. Are you muted, Belle? Yeah, I am. Sorry, just having trouble with um, <laughs> screen taking over, one thing taking over another. Um, right. <laughs> sorry about that. One second. Okay, I think I'm good now. <laughs> Morning, evening, everyone. Um, I'm Belle Tissot. I'm Assistant Director here in uh, Geoscience Australia and one of our product development teams. Um, today, I want to talk a little bit about um, the land cover classification system that we're building. Uh, how it's using Open Data Cube, and a little bit about the journey we've had in transitioning to use AWS for some of our development and processing needs. If I can get slides to work. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, so as everyone here is, I'm sure, um, very aware, we have vast amounts of satellite imagery, and tied to this are countless methods developed globally to draw land cover features of interest from this data which methods you use for a particular application or whether you decide to develop entirely new methods depends very much on your use case. So what we're working to develop is a land cover classification system, which as well as providing the annual land cover maps that we're wanting now for Australia is also flexible enough to be used in other regions at um, different scales, both temporal and spatial and is easily enhanced for future use. So, to address this, first and foremost, is the use of open data and um, open source software. But then we've also been, have in developing this software, we've worked to decouple the classification structure, so the categories that we're breaking our landscape into from the classification methods, the algorithms that we'll use to break it into these groups. We've um, been working on this project with in collaboration with a team from Aberystwyth University in Wales. And they've been using the system to create land cover maps for Wales. However, due to differing needs and they're using um, very different inputs to what we're using for our maps in Australia. For the structure side of it, we needed a globally recognized taxonomy. 
So here we're using the Food and Agriculture Organization's land cover classification system. The LCCS, as we call it, the LCCS structure is broken into two main phases. The first phase, which you see here, is what we call level three. And it consists of a decision tree structure with a series of binary decisions. So first we look at whether it's vegetated or not. And then we look at whether it was wet or not. And we can break it down further than looking at the vegetated side. We can say, was it cultivated or is it a natural area? So we have cultivated terrestrial vegetation and natural terrestrial vegetation and then cultivated aquatic and natural aquatic. On the non-vegetated side, we look at whether it was artificial or not. So we can get urban areas and bare surfaces and um, natural or artificial water bodies, which as I'm sure you can guess is not straightforward to get from remote sensing. Um, for each of these decisions, we define an input product to make that distinction. This means that we can very easily replace the input product being used for a particular decision step if a better one's developed or a different one happens to be more applicable for a given region. So this um, level three phase gives us our base eight land cover classes. And then on top of these, we have what we call level four, where you can draw in additional attributes to further describe these land cover classes. While our system's being built to functionally accommodate all of these classes, um, not all of these are reasonable to get from, or possible at all to get from remote sensing. And what we're focusing on implementing for Australia right now is a small portion of this that looks more like that. They're the classes that we're mapping initially for Australia and we're focusing on producing annual products um, using our Landsat archive. Um, for the input data sets for Australia, we have been using our Open Data Cube instance, Digital Earth Australia, to manage the input data. We're drawing from most, maybe all of the products, the existing products that we have in Digital Earth Australia and combining them or thresholding them, training models with them to create the new products needed for the classification. So it's very dependent on um, the Digital Earth Australia um, infrastructure and um, it's like it's drawn a lot on the um, the work that's come before it using so many products to feed into it um, means we are dependent on a lot of other things but it means we've saved a lot of time in trying to um, we don't have to process everything from the raw imagery we're using all of these fa fabulous products that other scientists come before us have already um, developed and, and worked on So before this project, we generally worked on our local supercomputer at the um, National Com Computational Infrastructure. We ran notebooks on the virtual desktop there. We converted these into Python files and submitted batch scripts to run our larger jobs. Um, our office has a fast direct connection, mostly stable connection to the, this computer and life was good. We were happy and to be honest, most of us saw no reason to change this at all. So what happened? Um, unfortunately, this wasn't an ideal setup for our colleagues in Wales. Whilst they could run batch jobs on the supercomputer remotely, the experimental science -y stuff, using notebooks, visualizing results, this was painfully slow for them. We really, really, really needed another solution. <clears throat> So uh, enter stage left, the sandbox. Um, the sandbox has been very transformational for our, um, for our colleagues, for our collaboration with people, our partners in different agencies, as well as particularly with um, our partners in Wales. So the sandbox is a web-based Jupyter lab environment with all the necessary software for working with Digital Earth Australia provided. So there was no additional configuration necessary. Um, all the products that we've been accessing through Open Data Cube on the supercomputer are also in a Data Cube instance on AWS and accessible through this sandbox interface. This was fabulous. Being browser-based, <clears throat> it was a super easy transition and it solved most of the problems that we were having with our, um, with our colleagues. 
the unforeseen benefit of this transition to using web-based infrastructure was when COVID hit and we all both here and in Wales started working from home. Um, having a stable experimental workspace which we could still all use even with in some cases less than ideal internet connections meant that our project's been able to continue to progress more smoothly than had we been relying solely on our trusty local supercomputer. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm recovering from a cold. Um, and so all was well in the world again, or was it? <clears throat> uh, more change. So toward the end of last year, there was um, a major upgrade scheduled for our local supercomputer. And whilst I would love to have think that this would all go to plan, I'm really just not that optimistic. Um, we had deadlines, we couldn't afford the downtime if it did happen. So we decided to move all of our land cover processing workflow into AWS. We were extremely lucky to have um, support in this transition from our fabulous cloud team. And even with the support, it was a steep learning curve, but absolutely worth it. It was great to learn a bit more about um, the services available in AWS and better understand how future projects can benefit from utilizing this tech. <clears throat> so I want to give a bit of an overview, a pretty high level overview on the workflow that we set up, perhaps to give some ideas to others on how this sort of thing could help them. So first we have a Docker image. This is like a snapshot of our installed application and the environment that it needs to run. <clears throat> we create it with like a recipe which defines everything needed for the application to run from installing Python packages, copying our custom code across and installing it, setting up environment variables. And we finally, we define a command which would run when, start, when it starts. <clears throat> we use AWS's uh, simple queue service which is our job queue. So we use this to define all the jobs that we want to run. In our case, each item in the queue was simply a string of an Alba's tile number and the year. We use Kubernetes to manage the creation of pods which have our Docker image installed. And in doing this, Kubernetes also, it looks at the queue size and it scales the number of running pods up and down as needed. <clears throat> and we then used uh, simple storage service S3. Um, this is where we output all our results. For those who haven't heard of this before, it's very much as the name suggests, it's just a place in the cloud to store your data. So the code that we had in our uh, Docker image is configured to first take an item from the queue. Remember, this is just a tile number in a year. And then based on that run our land cover classification for that tile year and save the results out to the S3 bucket and keep going until the queue's empty. <clears throat> the flexibility of this solution was fantastic. If I pop just a few items in the queue, Kubernetes will spin up just a couple of pods to do the work. If however, I wanna run continentally for a couple of years, I can fill the queue with a, a few thousand items and allow Kubernetes to scale up to hundreds of pods, which is fun, fun to watch it um, scale up and turn through all the work. And you can see how many items are left and what's going on as you go. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and now for some pretty pictures because um, what is all the science without pretty pictures at the end? Uh, these are the beta land cover maps that we created using at uh, level three using this AWS system. Um, some close-ups of um, Kakadu at level four. So some of the more remote areas and some of the cities. We also in, um, which I haven't gone into at all, have been doing, I'll only mention briefly, we're doing change mapping. So we get to this level four classification and then we can look at the differences um, in specific uh, areas to see what's going on. Here we can look at, I've just got a, a mining region in Northern Australia. Um, you can look at life form changes. So um, 
woody cover changes, whether it's changed from herbaceous to woody or the other direction, you can see areas which have had the forests removed or um, clearing, um, any sort of land clearing done. And it highlights it really clearly for people that are um, trying to monitor these particular changes. This is just a very small um, snippet of the, um, the change classes that we're doing. There are um, lots of them and we're working to uh, better understand at the moment which of these classes are the most useful ones and which things, uh, which changes combined provide the best information to our government partners for um, better understanding the landscape and um, how we can manage it. Thanks everybody. I think that I'm pretty on time. <laughs> Hope I didn't go over. Thank you so much, Pearl. That was perfect. Uh, so we are, we do have time for questions. Uh, if there are any from the audience, use the Q&A functionality in there to do that. Um, I have a quick question for you. So Landsat pixels are reasonably large, Bell, and I, land cover, I guess, change can be smaller than that. Is it possible or even required to be to be fuzzy in these things? And I, I, I anticipate that that's really hard when you've got so many classes too. Sorry, can you say that again? <clears throat> is, there, is it possible to be fuzzy in the boundary changes between, you know, wet, wet and dry and... Um, yeah, uh, that is rough. Um, <laughs> it's, we're not being fuzzy in the boundary changes and this has been challenging. Some of the things where um, we say, say um, vegetated or not vegetated, we're really talking about primarily vegetated or primarily not vegetated. And yeah. then we're looking, and it does cause concern for some people, um, if we say it's a bare area, there's virtually no bare areas in Australia. Like they all have, particularly when you're looking at a 25 meter pixel, there's some vegetation in there. So um, looking at um, when you get into the level four categories, looking at where the, um, adding things like um, percentage of canopy cover. So you can then get that fuzzier thing of going, okay, we're saying it's primarily bare, but we can then add, you know, that it's actually got a 20% cover. Yeah, sure. And so that's where we would get that fuzziness coming in is at that level four, adding those extra attributes to further define um, the range of things that are happening rather than the clear distinction. Got it. Got it. Um, you've also said that the sandbox has been very transformational. So what, I love the sandbox. What do you think <laughs> is the key, sort of, um, the key point that makes it so transformational? Um, We've been able to, so for our partners in Wales, having the same environment that we're working in has been great. I mean, we did have the NCI, but they couldn't really use it. Yeah. Um, we've also had uh, colleagues that are working, that are wanting to use our output, um, the outputs of this land cover classification that we've been able to set up on the sandbox. And it's been very easy for us to get them started because it's a notebook based environment. Yep. provide them with a notebook and say this is how you can explore the data that we're um that we're creating yep. it it's really really easy to get people up and running in there the accessibility um being in a browser is you know it's they, it's been insane it's really really great okay it's as simple as having a low barrier to entry yeah yes yeah they're the words that i was looking for but it is early here alex <laughs> Low barrier to entry, they're the words. Thank you. Um. <laughs> Look, thank you very much for your presentation, Bill. Um, and uh, next up, we have Terry Soul from the USGS, who is going to be talking about the USGS Grand Challenge, Earth Monitoring Analyses and Projections in EarthMap. So, over to you, Terry. And don't forget to unmute. which I can probably do for you. I'm a research physical scientist at uh, USGS Eros in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, I am uh, currently involved with uh, several projects at Eros, including uh, uh, one related to um, uh, landscape modeling uh, across the conterminous US. And I'm also a member of uh, a, a project that we're trying to kick off in USGS called Earth Monitoring, Analysis, and Prediction. And so 
the, the Earth Map project is um, very much a, a vision at this stage rather than a solution. And so what you're going to be hearing uh, today are, are some of the preliminary uh, concepts as we try to put this framework together. Our Earth Map is something that goes back to a workshop that we started in 2017. Uh, it was a workshop that was called by the USGS Council of Senior Science Advisors to look at uh, and summarize some of the grand challenges that would face USGS science over the next decade. And so we had about 30 or 35 people from across the USGS that were first asked to submit suggestions on overarching grand challenges. Uh, we had about 70 suggestions that were submitted and uh, over the course of a week we whittled those down and aggregated to the following four. Uh, some of these are capabilities that USGS already had a, a strong capacity in, you know, things like national resource security from an energy and mineral standpoint, or societal risk from existing and emerging threats, you know, things from a natural hazards program that we have in USGS. Uh, others, um, you know, smart infrastructure development, uh, you know, frankly to me, it is a little bit due to the timing of the workshop, which was right after the administration change and um, the, the new administration coming in uh, had a focus on infrastructure development and that ended up making the final four. Um, the fourth one is one I'll talk about quite a bit, anticipatory science for a changing landscape and we'll, we'll come back to that. So we, we knew that we had these four overarching challenges that we wanted to meet. Uh, we also knew that while we may have had the pieces that are in place across USGS, we didn't really have the framework from a data perspective, from a modeling perspective, from a dissemination perspective to really make this work. And, and so as part of the workshop report, we not only listed these four challenges, we also listed um, uh, Earth Map concept, which is the framework or the capability that allows uh, the USGS to actually meet these challenges. Um, you know, why are we doing Earth Map? Uh, well, first of all, many of the challenges that are facing us right now require a, a coordinated response uh, that, that's interdisciplinary in nature. And, uh, USGS has five mission areas and you know sometimes we don't play well with each other and and so Earth map is is very much about a, a shift in the way that we do science but it's also a shift in the culture uh, with increased cross mis cross mission area interdisciplinary activity uh, and interdisciplinary work with our partners and stakeholders um, we also knew that we wanted to move towards this anticipatory science paradigm and so if we have a Hurricane Sandy that hits New York, or if we have an earthquake in Southern California, you know, instead of reacting to the event, we wanna anticipate the event. We wanna be able to have the data available and accessible. Uh, we wanna have the models uh, in a, a modular interoperable framework that allows uh, quick access and development of, of approaches to, to respond to a, a, a event like an earthquake in, in, in near real time. And that anticipatory science paradigm is, is a huge part of where we're trying to go with EarthMap. Uh, USGS is, is kind of uniquely positioned to lead this in the, the US federal government and that, that we have a diversity of expertise that many agencies don't. You know, anything from uh, biodiversity to natural hazards, to energy and minerals, to land resources. Uh, we, we really are well positioned from a, a, a expertise standpoint. But again, we, we don't have that framework from a data perspective and, and from a science perspective to, to put those pieces together. Um, if you look at the evolution of the Earth Map concept, you know, going back to the workshop report itself, we had a very broad definition. And, the, and that definition is basically we're gonna integrate everything we do. Uh, well, you know, coming out of that workshop, uh, there was about two years that passed that not a lot went on with Earth Map, but uh, starting in 2019, uh, Jim Riley, the director of USGS, started to pick up on the Earth Map idea. And um, in, in November of last year, he, he had a blog post where he had a definition that, you know, Earth Map by 2020 or 2030 will deliver integrated observations and predictions of the future state of natural systems at multiple scales, working with a variety of partners. And that's actually a very good summary of where we're going with the Earth Map. Uh, concept. Um, the Earth Map project management team that I'm part of was stood up in November to try to generate um, progress in moving towards this vision. Uh, and this is a graphic that's been used a lot with regard to Earth Map that comes back 
from that 2017 workshop where we're building on a platform of research and development, using that to really play into our strengths in USGS, which is that observation and monitoring side. Uh, again, looking at it from an anticipatory science standpoint to use that data for modeling and integration, which is eventually uh, fed into a, a decision support framework and delivery that provides what we're calling actionable intelligence. And that's a goal that uh, the, the director is very fond of is, is linking the science that we do with the people on the ground that are, are able to turn that into a decision. Uh, from a data perspective, we're trying to integrate across everything that we do across USGS, be it atmospheric science or uh, fauna and flora or water chemistry or soils or geologic setting. And, and that's a challenge because from a data perspective, uh, even within those disciplines, there aren't standards sometimes, and it, it's an even more difficult uh, problem when you're trying to integrate these data sets and these models across multiple disciplines. Uh, this is a, a more up-to-date conceptual diagram of where we are with EarthMap that I'm, I'm quite fond of, and that we view EarthMap as being the intersection of three pieces. And so from a data and information standpoint, we definitely need to up our game. We need to improve uh, the collection, the assessment, the anal analyzing and, and dissemination of data uh, to facilitate the part on the lower left, which is that integrated predictive science that really lets USGS you know, look at things from an anticipatory standpoint. Uh, one thing you'll note though in the integrated predictive science uh, box, it mentions that this is developed in collaborative partnership with our stakeholders. And, and that's a, a paradigm shift that we're, we're trying to do across the USGS, now, not that we ignore stakeholders, but you know, too often science is done in a vacuum without the cooperation and, and partnership with the stakeholders that use that data. And you know, trying to link these pieces, you know, the data, the integrated predictive science, and that actionable intelligence through collaborative partnerships throughout the process is really what EarthMap's all about. Uh, EarthMap characteristics, I'll uh, kind of skim over this quickly because I've talked about a lot of these, but uh, EarthMap is interdisciplinary and collaborative. Uh, again, if you look at those left two sides, um, you know, we're trying to provide this collaborative environment uh, from a data perspective, a modeling perspective, a, a decision support perspective that allows us to translate that data into information, into something that can be used for decision making. Uh, it's comprehensive across space and time, which includes that predictive part. Um, and we can't do this without a, a technological transformation. And, and that's a, a huge part of what we're trying to do with EarthMap. Uh, so current and future EarthMap activities, we're working on a formulation plan to summarize the, 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 the plans for the next 10 years, uh, where we have a capacity assessment team and a use case assessment team that have been stood up to uh, develop an understanding of what we have within USGS, where we want to go, and what some of those gaps are. Uh, we have a, a communications blitz within the USGS to, to kind of win the hearts and minds of, of staff to, to change that way that we do business, particularly from a cultural standpoint. Um, and then we also have some pilot studies that are underway. And, and that's what I want to finish with is, um, so EarthMap is, is just starting to get off the ground. We, we just have the, the project management team that was stood up six months ago. And, and we're looking for opportunities. We're looking for puzzle pieces around which we can build this broader capability. Uh, the Delaware River Basin is a, a river basin just west of New York City, Philadelphia, that is an area that has a lot of USGS activity right now. And it's an area that um, we're focused on with trying to put those puzzle pieces together. And so from my perspective, I'm a land change modeler. And what I do is what's up on the top, you know, trying to take something like a Landsat classification, model back in time, model forward in time, and actually we're producing 10 year increments from the year 1680 in the Delaware River Basin, all the way out to 2100 in the future. So we can look at past, present and future landscape change. Uh, we're tying that to work that Gabriel Sine is gonna talk about in a little bit with regard to evapotranspiration and water use. Uh, we're tying that to water availability, both ground and surface water, so that we look at the conceptual, the practical, the technical linkages among these pieces as we try to build that puzzle uh, toward the earth map vision. And it's a big puzzle. And so, you know, if you look at that small task that we're trying to do with this work, um, what we're trying to do in the Delaware is, is, is a simple question. We're, we're trying to evaluate hydrologic change. 
Well, that involves demographics, involves climate and weather and socioeconomics and here, evapotranspiration. And, and so the challenge is to try to integrate groups that include a wide variety of USGS folks, uh, folks from other federal agencies, including Department of Energy, uh, folks across academia, uh, across um, a, a number of NGOs, and, and try to bring all the data, all the modeling expertise, all the multi multidisciplinary expertise to bear on this one issue. And that is a, a technical challenge that requires a look at architectures and capabilities that include things like the Pangeo framework or the ARIES framework, which includes the semantics and ontology of characterizing data or cloud hosting or HPC capacities. Um, and these are also a big part of this workshop that we have up and coming in the Delaware River Basin to try to move forward uh, towards that earth map vision. Uh, finally, um, one more slide. Um, we do have an official earth map pilot study that we're kicking off. Uh, we just hired a full-time person to lead work in the Colorado River Basin uh, in the southwestern United States, looking at drought as the primary issue. Um, we are kicking off some workshops in September to bring together scientists across the USGS and some of our stakeholders to try to identify what those issues are, what the key pieces are from the data perspective, and, and try to start to build towards that broader vision. Um, I think I'll stop there. Uh, so that's kind of where we are. You know, we're, we're at a, we have the vision and, you know, unlike what Bell presented, you know, we're, we're, we have the vision and we're looking for the solution to be able to, to handle this broad challenge. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, we've got a question from Tony, uh, Tony Butzer. So he says, how does analysis ready data, such as the collection through Landsat, uh, play into the earth map vision? Yeah, it's a, a, a wonderful data set to feed into the LC map project that you'll hear about in just a little bit from Jess Brown. Um, yeah, I kind of view it as a stepping stone. You know, we, we have that base of research and development in that one pyramid that I showed. Uh, you know, from a data perspective, something like ARD is that, that baseline data that allows for the dissemination or the, the uh, collection and, and analysis of land use data that you're going to hear about with LC map data. That in turn feeds the land cover modeling that I do. Um, and so the LC map data that we're getting from uh, the, that has just started to come out in, in the last couple of months is, is invaluable for what we're doing. And something like LC map just isn't possible with that analysis ready data. Yeah. Can um, this is a bit of a selfish question because I I work with data a lot. Can you? I don't know if it's your area, but can you talk about the data standards that are emerging to um, sort of underpin this earth map concept? Yeah, it's very much in flux. Uh, you know, one of the issues that we have as, as a new project is that um, we have a lot of those individual puzzle pieces at play. And, and one of the reasons that we're doing this capacity assessment is to get a good idea on, you know, what are the data standards that are out there from a, a USGS perspective? And also from a stakeholder perspective, and that we're, we're trying to build uh, one part of EarthMap is this data lake that is, uh, you know, something that provides access to USGS data, provides access to external data. Um, but identifying that standard is is still something that's in, in progress, just because of the stand, because we're we're trying to de to understand our current capacity and and what the the best path forward is. Got it. Sure. Um, one more question from me is, um, you have the modest goal of integrating everything that the USGS does, right? Um, <laughs> 2030. So <laughs> there's a bit of a bit of room there. Um, you talked about the pilot study here. Um, I guess I want to know how, like in an agile sense, the, 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 you need to sort of start delivering pieces and pilots and, and small chunks of infrastructure. How is that piece going, or is it, is it too early to be asking those kind of questions? Yeah, you know, I, I think the, the strategy we're using is sound from the, the standpoint that we know that a lot of the expertise and is already out there, and some of these integrated pieces are already out there. And um, there, there's a, a, a the, the water mission area, uh, one of the five mission areas in, in USGS, uh, has a program called NGWAS. It's the Next Generation Water Observing System, and they're they're focusing on certain pilot areas. The first was the Delaware. The second is the upper Colorado River Basin. 
And for now, we're kind of following them around because that's a wonderful platform that has some political backing as well um, to, to try to start to integrate these pieces. And so we're using these as kind of, you know, Bell uses the, the sandbox term. You know, for, for us, these two geographies are sandboxes to develop the capacity. Um, in the meantime, we're trying to also keep in mind you know, how do we, uh, how are these extensible? How are these scalable? You know, how are we able to take what we learn in these two basins and, yep. and apply them to another region or apply them to another country or, or to uh, the continent? And yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. the strategy we're taking. Thinking about scale at the start is pretty important, yeah. Oh yeah, very much so. Great, thanks heaps, Terry. Um, all right, and we'll move on to our next presenter, which is Robbie Bishop-Taylor from Geoscience Australia. And he's going to talk to us about DEA coastlines, a 30 year history of coastal change in Australia using earth observation data. So over to you, Robbie. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Robbie Bishop Taylor. I'm a coastal remote sensing scientist from Geoscience Australia. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about um, our work um, using open earth observation data to monitor coastal change at continental scale. So just to set the scene um, for this talk, I'm going to play a video in the background. Um, this is a an event which has been unfolding this week, just over the last few days, um, about 50 miles north of Sydney, um, where essentially along an entire stretch of coast, we've had multiple houses falling into the sea due to extreme erosion, um, and also an entire stretch of coastline that's been evacuated. Um, and so these kind of events are happening more and more frequently in Australia. Um, and a, it is a particular, coastal erosion is a particular problem here, essentially, because first of all, we have a, such a long coastline, we have, um, a coastline which is about 21,000 miles, um, 34,000 kilometers long, which is the sixth longest in the world. And most importantly, we're an incredibly coastal living country. So across um, the entire planet, about 40% of the world's population live within 60 miles of the coast, but in Australia, it's goes up to 90%. Um, so a huge amount of our population lives right on the coastline, um, or at least lives in communities which have their economies based on the coast. Um, and so one of the problems that um, we have in Australia um, at the moment, though, is that a lot of our coastal data sets are pretty much static. Um, so they were sort of mapped um, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, um, and haven't really changed over time. So a lot of areas, as you can see on the right, um, particularly up in northern Australia, are seeing huge amounts of coastal change every year in a scale of um, hundreds of metres um, up to kilometres over a few decades. And at the moment, our national data sets really don't take into, that into account. And so um, we wanted to see if we could use um, open um, earth observation data to really start to map coastlines um, at sort of temporal, a higher temporal frequency and so get a much more dynamic um, understanding of how a coastline is changing. So there were sort of two main, um, main goals we wanted to um, achieve with using earth observation data to monitor our coastlines. The first was we, it, we needed to do this at continental scale, so we wanted a method that would work across the whole of the country, um, across all of our different coastal environments. And we also wanted a method that could basically reach back in time and sort of get a really good understanding of how things have changed through time. Um, and so sort of that gives you information that you can then start to use for actually working out where these hotspots of change are and maybe use that to start monitoring your coastlines better. Um, so it's the only real um, satellite platform that lets us do both of those um, goals was Landsat. Um, so we have Landsat data that stretches back in the Digital Earth Australia archive um, to 1987. And so that's great. Um, the only limitation um, with Landsat is that we're dealing with 30 meter pixels. Um, and a lot of Australia's population lives on our east coast, which has quite um, steep, narrow beaches um, that only really change in a scale of about 10 to 20, 30 meters. So using 30 meter pixels is a big challenge for that um, because you lose all of the important data that you need to monitor these places. So last year we published a paper in remote sensing where we developed a new method to start extracting shorelines at better than a pixel resolution from Landsat data. Um, and so you can see on the right here, we've got some, the orange line is what you get if you just simply threshold the Landsat data to 30 meter pixels. And the blue line is what we're getting with these sub-pixel shorelines. Um, we essentially apply a contour extraction to Landsat data. And it's a lot closer to the black line, which is the well view to, a well view to comparison image. Um, so this is sort of a really um, exciting development because it means we can start to use Landsat data to get information at that really critical um, 30 meter scale. So the first thing we did was do some prototype testing. Um, a challenge with developing these products in Australia is that we 
don't have a great deal of validation data, but there is one site in Sydney um, that has been collecting beach profile data on the beach, basically with GPS and hand measuring it um, since the 1970s. And so in the middle is sort of our first example of satellite derived shorelines. And when we first got this result, we were a little bit discouraged because it kind of looks like a mess. You've got yellow shorelines, which are the most recent, um, sort of going back and forth. You've got um, shorelines, the old shorelines, all sort of basically everything's going on everywhere. Um, but when you start comparing that to the validation data, you get a result like this. Um, so orange is our shorelines, blue is the validation shorelines. And you can sort of see that we're really picking up the, the same patterns in the data. Um, but the most exciting thing is that um, all of this is occurring within this yellow boundary, which is the size of a lens at pixel. So we're really picking up details that are occurring at the scale of less than a pixel, which suddenly means that we can use um, Landsat data to monitor coastlines at that sort of management um, relevant scale. So the next challenge was um, expanding this into a method that worked at continental scale. It's really easy to just extract your lens from the, an individual image, but making this a, sort of a scalable process that takes into account all of the sort of different processes happening on the coast. So we need to um, account for clouds, we need to account for um, white water, um, sea spray, all of these things which can affect your data. And most importantly, we need to control for tide. Um, you can't be comparing a high tide image with a low tide image because you'll get a completely wrong idea of how things are changing. So essentially what we do is um, we use the open data cube to extract data for an entire year. On the left, we get a big stack of data. We then, for each image in the data set, um, we work out for, on a pixel basis whether what the exact tide was when the image was taken. And then we filter out all of the high, high and low tides. And we just keep the middle 50 percentile of tides um, around mean sea level. And so then using that sort of um, tide mass data set, we combine that into a single median composite um, and so we get this really nice, clean, um, cloud-free data set, which indicates um, roughly the coast, what the coastline looked like uh, at, media, at um, mean sea level. And so using that data set, we then convert that to a water index. We're using MNDWA, and we use the subpixel waterline extraction to extract a precise shoreline. And so if we do that to every single year in a data set, we get um, something like this on the left, where each line is a different shoreline, going from um, old in dark to um, new in yellow. And then using that data, we can then start to do things like extract rates of change. So for every 30, 30 meters along our coastline, we can work out exactly um, what areas have changed significantly through time and at what rate. And so these are uh, your hotspots of erosion and your hotspots of um, growth or progradation. And from that, we then wanted to, so one of the biggest challenges of this is we've got a huge amount of data when we apply this to continental scale. We really want to develop a way that we don't overload the user with too much information in one go. So we've sort of developed this quite scale dependent um, visualization method where the user gets a summary at the entire continental scale and then increasingly more detailed information as they zoom in. So here they can sort of look at these coastal change rates, they can compare rates with different locations, and then they can zoom in even further if they're interested in more data and look at the actual coastlines themselves, so these lines. So we, sort of, we didn't want to overload people with all of this information, we just wanted to let them get what they need at the time they need it. So we're currently in, um, in the middle of a validation process for this. Um, so we've been gathering up all of the different validation data sets that exist um, from different entities around Australia and sort of trying to get them into a standard format. And so while this is still ongoing, we've got some really promising results so far. So this is a, a um, validation comparison for WA, which is um, in the west of Australia. Um, and we're getting results that are accurate to around 10 metres, which is really a sort of a, a accuracy which is relevant for coastal management in Australia on these sort of narrow beaches. Um, and so you can sort of see all sorts of amazing examples of coastal change um, in this data set. So we've got examples of um, the effect of erosion on infrastructure and also the effect of infrastructure on erosion. Um, so here in Port Beach and WA, they built um, this really large port in the early 2000s. You can see the port construction. You can also see how that has then had an effect on erosion through time. Um, and so you can see on the right here, we've got a bit of a, a red erosion hotspot down the bottom, and that matches up nicely with um, some of the, sort of the local mapping done using a much more high resolution data. We can also pick up really amazing geomorphic change. So on the left, we've got a, an island which is slowly migrating to the north in the Great Barrier Reef. We've also got some just incredible examples of mouth bar dynamics, um, interactions between um, flows from rivers and um, sediment transport up our coast. So you can sort of get this really rich um, idea of how 
our coastlines are changing through time with this data. Um, and I sort of hope that this is not that it replaces existing data sets, but more that it sort of um, starts to fill in gaps that exist in um, existing coastal monitoring programs. So this is an example, a comparison between um, some local state data um, in the middle, where you've got a few lines that they've flown a plane over the top um, in those years. We're picking up the same patterns, but we're getting a much richer temporal history of these places. So it gives you a much better idea of rates of change through time and also an understanding of whether these changes are gradual or event-based. And so the next steps for this is also this, once we've identified this sort of erosion hotspots and, um, and growth hotspots, you can also start to look at how climate is interacting with coastal erosion. Um, so in Australia, a lot of our coastal erosion is driven by um, climate drivers, so ENSO sudden oscillation. And so during La Nina events, we get these much, like these really big storm events along our east coast, which then lead to large swells and beach erosion. And then the beaches build back again during El Nino. So what we can do is we can compare our rates of change um, through time with um, indexes based on climate and start to sort of get an idea of what areas of shoreline respond to coastal to these climate events and how much. And start to potentially use that in a predictive capacity to sort of get an idea of if we know that um, this climate index is going this way in this year, what, um, how are our beaches likely to respond? So to summarise, um, DA Coastlands is a continental product um, giving mean sea level shorelines and rates of change through time. Um, it's, we're hoping to release this as an open source product um, in the end of this year. And all of the data is, um, all of the data will be freely available and all of the code will be freely available. So our hope is that we can, this method will be broadly applicable to anywhere that you've got access to a large stack of um, analysis ready data, um, potentially um, engaging with um, initiatives like Digital Love Africa and the CS Coast program to um, expand this method to other parts of the world that really need that source of cheap and affordable um, and scalable um, coastal monitoring. So that's all for me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Robbie. And um, I just want to say that you do some fantastic uh, science comms in your presentations. It's great to see. Yeah. Um, can you talk about how it's how the result of your work is used or how it might be used in decision making or like specific um, cases? Like what, what's the application? Yeah, so at this stage, the largest application is places. Um, a lot of our coastlines, so we're, we're particularly working with the WA government at the moment. Um, they have a huge coastline that extends across huge areas of Australia, um, but they've only really got detailed data for um, small areas of it that they can afford to fly planes over. Mm. So we're sort of, we're really hoping that this will be, give them a sort of a much deeper temporal history and also a much larger scale um, data that they can use to start monitoring coastlines in areas that they just simply can't afford to fly. Um, over, yep. so it's sort of that it's that, that filling filling gaps that they that's just unaffordable to to do with other methods and a coastline as large as Australia. Um, yeah, sure. absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Um, the other question I have is: is it is it possible to do a similar method from aerial imagery, or or do, do, like so so thinking about going earlier than 1987? Um, can we combine it with some of the aerial photogrammetry? Yeah, so the, the sort of the key, I guess, novelty of, of this product is that we are taking into account tidal effects. Yeah. Um, and so because we basically, we take every pixel, individual pixel that's been acquired by a satellite and tag them with tides, we can then filter by tides and get this sort of really nice comparable um, range of pixels that we can, we can look at through time. Yeah. The problem with aerial imagery is that you're just dealing with individually acquired images, which can be taken at low tide, high tide, mid tide. Um, and often the metadata you need to to work out what the tide was when you flew it, like these these images are usually labelled with just a date. Yeah, sure. Um, so it is. It's definitely. It's the. It provides this sort of a contextual information, but it's difficult to compare directly unless they've specifically flown it at mid tide. Um, right. But often it, it it's still it's there's an amazing sort of data out there um, that we'd really love to start comparing. But it's a sort of, it is there's challenges in comparing that directly. Yeah, and it's pretty sparse too. Hey, I mean the density. Yeah and the and the um the history yes yeah, it's, it's it's a really cool really cool work i think i think this um application of earth observation data goes the closest to classic gis where you where you merging that tidal data with the um, satellite data is obvious once you've done it but it's not very obvious before you've done it right? yeah 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 there's a there's a huge amount of science you can do once you have imagery combined with um tide information it's just yeah there's an amazing stuff that that combination is very powerful yeah Cool. Well, thank you very much, Robbie. 
and we'll move on to our, oh, I've got, um, actually, I've got a couple of questions here. I'll just ask you this one quickly. Uh, so Jay Wickham says, are you thinking of using Sentinel or other high resolution for validation of, of the later years? So we're thinking of integrating Sentinel as a data source as well. Um, we've found that it is to get sort of the validation data we need, we really need a rich sort of temporal history. Um, and so, be so individual beach locations where they have gone and surveyed every every month or every year is fantastic. Um, to do a validation with high resolution satellite imagery would require a lot of data, and often that's from commercial providers that would cost a lot. Um, so it's probably we're focusing more on Sentinel as a future thing that we can integrate into this rather than using it as a validation data set. Um, but it's yeah, there's definitely um, scope for, for doing some validation with satellite data. Right. And Tony's got a question I'll ask real quick. Um, where, where's the line between using Jupyter Notebooks and uh, an interactive web map? Yeah, okay, so um, our aim is that the main the publicly accessible um, service will be an interactive web map. Um, so that's where most users will interact with, but then we want to, uh, we're gonna have a set of Jupyter Notebooks that basically allow the users to do some sort of more um, in detailed in-depth analysis. So, We've got some that let you sort of zoom into the coastline and draw a profile and get um, exact data from how the coastline's changed with that location, or other ones where you can sort of draw a box around your area of interest and get a history of um, like sort of a histogram of change um, for that location. So it's the most users will hopefully be um, the web map will be what they need, but there's that sort of ability to deep dive and get more information if they want through Jupyter notebooks. Awesome, great, thanks, Robbie. Okay. Um, next up. We have Jesslyn Brown from USGS, who will be talking about monitoring land surface change with Landsat analysis ready data. So, please don't forget to unmute. I think I can hear you. Um, one yep. more step. Can you hear me okay? Yep, loud and clear. Oh. Great. And you can still see my screen. Good. Okay. So thank you very much to the organizers um, for allowing me to participate in, in today's event. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, I'm Jocelyn Brown from uh, the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, also like Terry from in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And I'm going to talk about monitoring land surface change using analysis ready data um, as, as uh, Alex introduced. So my organization, USGS, has a goal to understand a changing world. And we know that remote sensing is a, a very useful tool for this, um, but change is complex and we need a, a strong framework to do this. Um, I'm just showing here some different types of land surface change, abrupt change, gradual change, and then change that are changes that are, um, you know, natural and anthropogenic. And, you know, so we need, the, need a framework to be able to detect, detect all of these and characterize them as well as um, uh, integrated with that, as well as describe the, the land surface um, it, and classify the land cover. You know, forest change in a forest landscape is uh, relatively infrequent, but yet uh, it, there's a lot of variety. So as you can see, this, this is uh, the kind of um, uh, change that we're trying to capture and to expand our techniques, um, not only to for, for forested landscapes, but, but for all land cover types. So I'm gonna center my talk around um, this project that I'm in a leadership role in uh, called Land Change Monitoring Assessment and Projection, uh, LC Map for short. So this is a framework for continuous tracking of land surface change using the monitoring uh, as a basis for summarizing change across space and through time and extending the time period for which we can understand the land surface. So the assessment part and the, uh, the assessment piece and the projection piece is where we gain understanding um, and are able to look um, with projection uh, both before and after um, the, the satellite record that we're using. And this builds on a rich USGS history of land change R&D um, and operational mapping that, that, that we've been involved in for years. And through LCMAP, we can move away from scene-based analysis to per pixel analysis over time and move from data to answers, um, like, like uh, um, Pete Dusset's introduction um, related, related to uh, data science. 
So we, we are basing our analysis on uh, our work on the Landsat analysis ready data. So this is, this is a very similar, similar in concept and, and probably also in actuality to um, the open data cube for Australia that's been discussed. Um, in fact, we we're probably really inspired by Geoscience Australia to do this. Uh, um, so our ARD, our Landsat ARD is a reconditioning of the Landsat archive. Um, and right now it's based on collection one, tier one, uh, thematic mapper and um, OLI imagery. You know, it goes back to um, 1982. So we are starting with 1982 for conterminous US. We're very fortunate to have a very rich uh, record of Landsat in the US. And we do the, some higher order um, processing to these data to, to get, um, you know, surface reflect, reflectance and brightness temperature. And this package, you know, these packages result in, you know, really, really lovely giant um, stacks of, of, of very well uh, geometrically uh, rectified data. And we've been, we and LCMAP have been working with this data since, um, since it was released, um, you know, very shortly thereafter. And so you need you need these this dense time series in order to to monitor land surface change. And Robbie just mentioned that earlier. You know that there's there's not a lot of um, substitution for this deep record. And for those data geeks out there, I'm going to show a few statistics. Um, so this is the the record that we're talking about: 38 years of Landsat data, as I said, from 1982 forward. Um, I'm not going to read all the, the numbers. Um, you can read those, but you know, it results in a, in, a, in a large amount of data. This is, this is big data for sure, uh, 286 terabytes um, uh, for this data set. And this is what the, the ARD data look like. They're tiled 150 uh, kilometers on a side. And we are also produced, not only producing this for um, uh, conterminous U.S., the lower 48 states, but for Alaska and Hawaii too. But Landsat varies across, uh, the data vary across space and time. So this, you know, you'll see these overall uh, numbers of observations by tile where the red color, uh, red colors show the, the higher density. Um, and we have um, also seasonal and geographic and seasonal variability geographic variability and variability across the record. So this, this graphic just shows for four different lo tile locations um, spread around the country, uh, how uh, data density varies through time as well, seasonally. And, and you know, California is lovely because it's a, um, there's a lot uh, less clouds there. It's a lot better um, data acquisition. So we're utilizing these data to um, do this, uh, um, this, this monitoring of the Earth's surface. Um, ARD stacks are, are uh, ingested to perform systematic consistent land monitoring at the 30 meter resolution. And we're doing it in shorter time steps than we've done before. We're ingesting all of the, uh, all of the data, but then we're using all of the high quality and non-cloudy data um, in our approach. Uh, the, the basic modeling algorithm we're focused on is continuous change detection and classification, CCDC. Um, published by Zhe and Wood Woodcock in 2014, and we've taken that, and um, you know now we're running it at scale across the conterminous U.S. We've had to do some adjustments, um, um, but it, it's functioning pretty well uh, due to the frequency of change events and the actual frequency of Landsat data, um, and and uh, direction from the user community. We have decided to use this process to produce annual uh, products. So this is what our suite of annual products looks like. Um, these are 10, uh, 10 related, um, interrelated, inter integrated uh, products on change, changes on the bottom line, uh, bottom row, and cover, um, uh, attributes of cover on the top row. And I don't have time to go into a lot of detail, but we just released our first uh, product video on our website, um, and we're gonna have a, a suite, a, a set of videos on all of these products. We just released this collection in June. Uh, it goes back to 1985. The first few years of Landsat, we didn't have enough observations to, 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 uh, to uh, we, we weren't confident in our results. So um, 85 through 2017 is this first collection. Um, we're turning around and producing another collection to go through 2000, 
19 here, um, hopefully by the end of this calendar year. Um, so uh, I wanted to share a little bit about our, our system capabilities. So th this, wor this work is done in, in an on-premises infrastructure, um, but it, uh, and, and it's what we have set up internally and actually the, the Mesos cluster that we're uh, processing on, uh, LC map um, those products on, it also supports, um, you know, some Landsat collection one um, processing as well um, for surface reflectance and, and those products. So it's, it's a pretty hefty system. So we're not yet in cloud per se, operating in the cloud, um, but this um, shared, shared computing cluster has a lot of characteristics to uh, similar characteristics to cloud systems and, and has a lot of parallels, including distributed storage clusters, providing high data throughput under heavy parallel access workloads, um, distributed computing clusters, uh, connected directly to storage systems via high throughput networks, um, and, and um, many other characteristics. So, so we're not on the cloud yet, but it's our intention to um, process uh, LC map kinds of, kinds of things in the uh, products in the cloud in the future. Um, just because of this heavy, um, you know, this heavy amount of data that we're processing as well as, um, um, you know, the long time series. So this annual product suite, we expect it to make val valuable contributions to many applications um, for a broad user community. We didn't partner um, directly with any one user community for this, but we took a lot of um, uh, input from our experience um, putting out the national land cover data set and and users basically do want um, information um, over a longer time period and um, more more frequently uh, in higher time steps and and federal land manage managers were anticipating use from them state and local land managers academic and federal research um, landscape modeling um, carbon sequestration modeling, et cetera. And I'm kind of embarrassed showing a coastline line example um, after Robbie's excellent, um, much sort of higher detail coastline. Um, but th this is what we're producing here and it, it is a better look than we've had in the past. So um, we are validating uh, our work as we go. So the collection one has been validated. You'll see an overall accuracy of primary land cover at 82.5%, a little lower than we, we were um, hoping for, um, and annual land cover change around the same, same level of accuracy. This is based on a large, a large quantity of um, random points across the conus that we have um, done uh, photo interpretation with very, um, uh, with, a, with a crew of expert interpreters to, um, you know, to collect these data. And, and they, they've looked at um, 80, 850,000 unique obs uh, observations, um, the, uh, an incredible uh, resource. And this, this has been published as well. The validation data are available to the public as well. So that's the, the monitoring is really sort of the big data part of what we're doing right now. Um, uh, but it leads to, you know, in order to get to information and knowledge, it leads to assessments and projections. So these other two components of LC map, I'm going to really um, just just uh, skim over, um, but do want to say that we're um, characterizing land change and describing it from from 1985 through this record um, in order to increase understanding of, of landscape scale processing and processes and drivers. And we're trying to answer these basic questions of, of land change science. When, where, and how is the land surface changing? What are the causes and consequences of those change, changes? And the projection piece, actually Terry, who spoke just a little bit earlier, is, is the lead on our projection. Um, this also builds on the analysis of, of the monitoring products that we're putting out, um, specifically utilizing one um, scenario-based land change modeling um, system, although this is just one of many that can be used. Uh, LC map helps with um, providing this, this long time period, this 33 years now, and, and also assists with uh, um, the realistic patch scale information 
of change. And the, uh, Terry was talking about work that was going on in the Delaware River Basin. This animation I'm showing um, shows, uh, you know, uh, prior to the Landsat record, through the Landsat record, and then up forward to 2100, um, and, and shows a lot of this, this wonderful detail of, of modeled land cover over time. Our future focus is on uh, immediately on updating um, on conversion to collection to Landsat when that's released and a cloud capability on um, the testing on um, CCDC with collection two inputs will start uh, when we uh, get access to those data, which we understand will be later in, in 2020. An expansion of our work to Alaska and Hawaii we're, we're, we're in testing there, and I don't have time to present that. Hawaii is going very well. Alaska will be um, a little tougher because it, it's a, it's a, um, there are some technical um, challenges there. And we don't have as much data. We won't be able to go back earlier than about the year 2000 because of lack of, uh, of the Landsat record. So this is an opportunity to do a little shameless promotion. Um, this is where you... Uh, can acquire these data. And again, since we're not on the cloud yet, um, our uh, data distribution is maybe mainly through um, our good old Earth Explorer. And we do have stood up a, a viewer for um, people to uh, uh, look at and download data, smaller data sets from. And please visit our, our website for more information. And I in closing, I'd just like, as I wrap up, I'd just like to present some sort of overarching um, uh, output from our database, which is a, a, what we're calling the footprint of change across the, the conterminous US. Um, on the left is the, the output from uh, CCDC models themselves. So those are um, a accumulation of abrupt changes that have, have occurred or that CCDC has, has detected across the landscape. And on the right is the uh, land cover change. So, so this is actual, um, this is the summarization of, of uh, land cover shifts uh, where, where the cover has actually um, been changed from one thing to another. Um, so we've, we've never seen this before. We, we have not had access to how often the land surface is changing. And through this long record of big data, um, provided by analysis of, uh, you know, our work analyzing the analysis ready data and the Landsat record, we now know that about 12% of the conterminous U.S. has experienced a land cover change during this 33 year period. Um, but really less than, than 1%, right around 1% of the, of the land area changes annual, annually. So annual change is pretty rare. Um, but in certain locations, the Southeast US, for example, we see much more frequent change. And this has changed back and forth um, due to natural resource cycling. And so that, that's that um, forestry, you know, anthropogenic and uh, anthropogenic change um, related to forest cutting and forest growth. So interesting um, results. I, it, 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 we're, we're aware that these things are happening on the Earth's surface, but now we have wall to wall information. Um, showing us what's happening. So I've shared a little bit about the foundations of LCMAP using the big data of the Landsat ARD and the characteristics of our um, monitoring technique and a little bit on our infrastructure. Um, um, you know, as the, uh, our analysis of big data is the way that we're moving from, from data to answers. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to Alex. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jesslyn, and you've delivered such a great presentation that you've answered all my questions as, as I've written them down. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Okay. I thought I had one, um, but I, I might just ask it in a in a nutshell around that last slide. Is um, uh, you've talked about anthropogenic change, so I guess that's that's humans extracting resources or or paving surfaces. Um, I don't know the U.S. well, but the Midwest seems to have a bunch of changes across. Um, I wonder if you can talk about how much is um, changes in uh, long-term weather to, to try to avoid saying climate change. Yeah, so weather is an, uh, an impact in that middle part of the country. So we have uh, um, a great portion of that part of our country is uh, 
rangelands or grasslands, and they're pretty sensitive to um, weather events or interannual um, um, weather and climate, if you will. Um, so CCDC is responding to those. Many of those changes, um, that slide had two parts, you know, the red and the purple. The, the purple showed less change. So many of those um, events do not lead to a shift in land cover, but they are detected as abrupt change. We're just trying to get a handle on, um, on those right now because uh, the, the techniques were, were really strongly, the tires were kicked very well um, over forested landscapes. And then when we expanded to using the same um, techniques over grasslands, we started seeing these, um, you know, basically the events you're talking about, something to do with drought or, um, you know, moisture fluctuations is ca causing CCDC to respond. It's, it's, it's a benefit as well as a, a challenge because, you know, we have to be able to describe those and, and understand what's causing the, what the, the changes that we're seeing. What about the next level there, you know, the, the change in change? Is, is change accelerating? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Uh, I think you're talking about, yeah, does, do we get different um, sort of frequency of change over time? So there's, there's 30 years of data, say, is, um, is the environment changing more now than it used to change? Yeah, I, uh, we are just looking through the record. Um, I don't have an answer for that for you right now. I don't think we have seen that. Um, but, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to delve into that a bit more. Um, it, 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 it does fluctuate. The, 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 um, the slide that I showed on monitoring actually had a time series of um, urban change or developed land change. That definitely is less change now than it was in the early part of the record. And it looks like it's uh, um, influenced by the Great Recession that we had in you know, starting in 2007 and 2008. So it's going to depend on the, the um, surface, co the cover that you're looking at, whether there's a change through time. Right, cool. All right, well, we need to move Thanks. along. Thank you very much for your presentation. Next up, we have Claire Krauss from Geoscience Australia, who is going to talk, uh, whose talk is titled From Water Observations to Compliance Tools. So over to you, Claire. Gotcha. Cool. Well, good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, my name's Claire Krauss and I work in one of the science product development teams. And I'm gonna talk you through a project that we've been working on for the last 18 months um, based off a problem that was presented to us. So we have a number of stakeholders across uh, federal and state governments in Australia, and they came to us with this problem. Where are water bodies across the Murray Darling Basin chain, uh, across the Murray Darling Basin, and how is the water in them changing over time? So, in Australia, we have a large basin system that we call the Murray Darling Basin that makes up about 14% of the surface area of Australia. So, this is a largely rain fed system and it accounts for about 50% of Australia's irrigated produce or um, $19.4 billion worth of agricultural output every single year. Um, it's also a heavily water limited system and it's a heavily regulated system. So there is an overarching government department called the Murray-Darling Basin Authority that is in charge of overseeing the distribution of water within this system. Um, and the state governments, um, there's three states, uh, for, well, it's actually four states in a territory, um, but the main state we'll talk about today is New South Wales. And um, if you can see my cursor, basically it's this big hunk in the middle here is all in New South Wales. And so what the state government's job is, is to make sure that the water is meted out fairly and that people are adhering to the rules. So that is why we were asked to help them with developing a product that will tell them where people are storing water in the landscape and how the amount of water in those storages is changing through time. So we have a product that we've already um, 
released called the Water Observations from Space product. And this is a, a screen capture of that product. And as you can see, it's quite beautiful. And what it does is it tells you the frequency of water observations for each pixel through all time. So this particular screen grab here is an inland lake system in the northern part of Australia. And the different colors tell you the frequency with which water is observed. So where you're seeing the kind of orange and red color, it's saying that the water has only been seen in these locations for one to two, maybe to 5% of the entire record from 1987 to 2018. Um, the greens through to blues are showing those more persistent water um, observations. And where you see blue, and um, you don't see it in this particular plot because this is an ephemeral system, but you're starting to see persistent water. So this product is, is amazing and gives you huge insights into what's happening across Australia but it does so as a raster product. So it's a, a picture of Australia. It's based on pixels and each pixel is independent from the pixel next to it. So one of the key things that we wanted to do with this particular product was to develop a vector-based data set. So the idea of that is that we don't necessarily want to deal with a thousand individual pixels to make up a water body. We wanna be able to look at that water body as a complete object and look at how that object is changing through time. So that's exactly what this product that we call Digital Earth Australia Water Bodies does. It turns our water observations from space product into a vector-based product, which allows us to look at each individual water body and how the surface area of water within that water body is changing over time. So the um, workflow to produce that product basically takes the water observations from space product and applies a series of decision steps to get to a point where we are looking at the more persistent water bodies and the locations of those more persistent water across Australia. So we've intentionally thrown out um, places where we get flash flooding um, and those large floodplain systems where you really only see those um, those areas considered water bodies or, or wet for a very small percentage of time. So you can see in this picture here, you've got the WAFs on the left and what we've pulled out as our vector data set on the right. And you can see how the extents of it has been clipped. And that's part of our thresholding that we did to remove those more kind of um, less frequently seen areas of water. So the outcome from that product um, from that workflow is a product that looks like this. So it is a map of Australia um, that shows you the locations of all of the persistent water bodies across the country. So there are um, just shy of 300,000 that we've mapped and we've intentionally thrown out the really coastal ones that are connected to the ocean because those are affected by tide rather than by other factors. So we've, we've tried to um, cut out those very coastal systems. Um, and in the Murray-Darling Basin, which is where we were asked to to focus our work, we've got about 60,000 water bodies that we've been able to map. So the map, when you kind of show it like this, it makes it look like there's water everywhere, but that's just a trick of the way I've plotted it. When you scale the lines for each water body um, and just show the area, what you can see is something that looks like this. And what we've been able to show is that water bodies, um, where water is more persistently in the landscape, cover about 1% of the Australian landmass. So one of the advantages of being able to look at water bodies as a whole object is that now that we've mapped them, we can start to look at the change over time. So in this little schematic, you can see in the top left, if our little red outline is our water body, um, we can see in our 2014 time snapshot there that we would say that 100% of the surface area of that water body is wet. In 2015, we have something around 40%. 2016, the one at the bottom, you can see there's a little bit of water left in there. So that maps to about a 5% area. And what you get when you start to do that for every individual landsat observation is you get a time history of the changing surface area of water within that water body. So here's a result from uh, a lake system just outside of Canberra where we are um, called Lake George. And what you can see from this time history, um, and again, we go back to about 1987 or so, um, is the change in the surface area of Lake George through time. So you can see there are times where the system is relatively full. So here's uh, an image um, shown in false color of uh, Lake George. And you can see that where we have mapped to approximately 100% surface cover of water, 
when you look at the imagery, you can see that there's a lot of blue there, that the lake is essentially full. Where we've got an area uh, where we've got less water mapped, so we're looking at around a 60 to six, uh, 50 to 60 percent surface area coverage. And what you can see is those little areas on the um, sort of north northwestern part of the lake is starting to dry out. So you can start to see the behavior of the lake um, drying out. And then here we've got a, a picture from late last year or in the middle of last year where we were in quite a, a heavy sort of dry period. And you can see that um, consequently our time series also reflects that. So you've got um, a time where there's pretty much no water being mapped at all. So because we've got this, um, these water bodies mapped, we're able to do this exact analysis for every single one of those 300,000 odd water bodies across Australia. And we've made this available through a map portal. So this is our um, Digital Earth Australia map portal, which is a Terrier based portal. And you can go on there and you can start to click around and have a play. So here's that exact same example, but showing you through that portal. And you can see that when you click on it, you get the time history of the surface area change in um, water, uh, water area for that particular system. Um, and through this portal, you can download the data as well. Here's a, a really interesting system right in the northern part of Australia. So this is a monsoonal um, little oxbow lake. And so it, you can see that it fills up during the wet season and then dries down during the dry season. So you can start to see the behaviour through time of these particular water bodies and how they vary across the country. This one here, <coughs> excuse me, is a, um, a um, a town water supply in um, a relatively drought prone area. And you can see that the surface area of this particular dam changes quite dramatically through the record as the amount of water available in this water supply changes through time. So remembering that we were trying to assist with water compliance, what we have been able to do is map the locations of farm storages. And what an unexpected advantage of this product was, is if you start to click around and look at some of these constructed water bodies, what you can see from that time history is the history of their construction. So for this particular example, you can see that we're not seeing a water signature for the first third of the record, and then all of a sudden we start to see water. And we've used that as an indication of the approximate construction date for these storages. And again, because this is all done programmatically, we can programmatically go through and analyze all of those water bodies to pull out that estimated construction date. For compliance purposes, what we're really looking for are outliers. So I've got two particular, two little um, water bodies that we've mapped here and the time history for both of them. And you can see that generally they're both filling at around the same time. But if you're a compliance officer, what you're looking for is a time when a water body may have filled when it wasn't supposed to. So the water compliance officers have all the information around license, when people are allowed to take what water, what they're allowed to take. Um, and so when you pull this kind of information together with the information around the legality of the fill and emptying events, what you get is a really, really powerful water compliance tool. So this particular tool was recently used for a water compliance activity in northern New South Wales. So um, there was an embargo placed on water take um, at the start of this year because um, the, the drought really was quite bad and they, the um, first flush, the first big rain event had come through. And so they decided that this was gonna be used to flush out the system. So they said, no, we're not gonna, we're gonna ask you not to take water at this particular time. And so we assisted the compliance officers to um, monitor that particular event by providing them that change in surface area um, information for 2,293 dams. So um, we were able to tell them what was the surface area of water before the embargo started, during the embargo, and once it was lifted. And what they were really looking for was things that were starting to show an increase in surface area during a time when there shouldn't have been, um, there shouldn't have been any take. So by using this kind of compliance tool, they were able to take a task that for a single person or even a team of people would have taken weeks to months. They were able to get that down from two, two and a bit thousand dams down to 250 almost overnight. Like it just was done straight away because we were able to use this particular tool to tell them where they should focus their efforts. And then the, um, the team was able to actually only pay attention to those storages that they knew that there was something going on in. So this particular tool 
has been hugely um, important for these compliance teams because it takes the amount of time that they need to do their activities and it just makes them, it allows them to focus their efforts. So there's obviously a whole bunch of caveats that we understand because of um, this being a remotely sensed product and also it's only looking at surface area, but because we're able to provide that first pass of information, the um, compliance officers can then focus their activities and do their actual in-depth validation on a much smaller number of storages. That's it, thank you. Thanks heaps, Claire. <coughs> um, and it's great to see that relationship out to, um, I guess, decision making and, and real applications there with that example. Uh, Gabriel has a question, which is, how often do you update the water bodies? How do you look for new ones? And, and I guess that sort of segues into how is the, um, I guess, the, the default extent of a water body defined? Yeah, so this, um, so the Let's, so we'll put the mapping question aside. In terms of the updating of the time history, we update them at about the cadence that we're getting the definitive Landsat ARD collection. Mm -hmm. So um, internally, it's about somewhere between two and four weeks after the satellite's overhead by the time we run all of our ARD processes, do all of the data preparation, and then upload this data set. What we were able to do was to use some Sentinel data um, and use a, we've got a, an internal Sentinel near real-time feed, which gives you information within 24 hours of an acquisition to be able to sort of do a bit of a stopgap for where there are time um, requirements that things happen quickly. But that complete 300,000 um, water body time history is updated continuously as part of our operational um, products. Um, and we will be looking to try and decrease that that latency from two to four weeks down to a few days if we can. Um, so that's our next tranche of work. So okay. in terms of the mapping, so the mapping has so far been produced using an all time record from 20, uh, sorry, 1987 to 2018. And um, the workflow was developed using that giant block of time and looking for the frequency of water observations in that time history. What we will be doing going forward is trying to um, continually update that mapping. So particularly around constructed water bodies, we know that they're always being built. So we wanna make sure that we're keeping up to date with what's actually going on on the ground. And so the entire process that you've seen there to produce those water bodies is all automated. It's all written into Python scripting. So what the next task will be is to go through and look at how we apply that script and those processes to smaller time periods so that we can get the more recent data. Um, so it's just a case of playing with um, time periods and looking at the sensitivity of those results um, and then supplementing that water body data set that we already have. I did find a few instances where a water body was actually decommissioned. So it was shown up um, because it had been wet from 1987 to 1995 or something and then it hadn't been used since. So there are a few water bodies that we uh, have been mapped but we know haven't been used recently. And we can actually go and use those time histories to tell us things like that as well. So the intention is to continually update this mapping, hopefully annually, um, but that's something that we're still working on. Great, cool. Um, I was curious, and you've sort of touched on it, around uh, the relationship between surface area and actual volume. Um, like, is it, does it unfairly sort of highlight people with shallow dams, look, making look like they're stealing water? <laughs> I um, it, it sort of does. So if you can imagine that you have two storages, one of them is a cube and one of them is a flat bowl, what yeah. you're going to see on the flat bowl is a much greater change um, as things go from kind of full to empty. You're going to see that change in the surface area. If you have a cube, basically the only time that you're going to see things see a change is when it goes completely dry and you might only put another you know five percent of the actual volume of the storage in and it'll show up as a 100 percent surface area change yeah. and so that's something that we've done a lot of work around the communication of this product um, if you if you see here um, there's actually a red bar that comes up onto our product and it, it says exactly that because we wanted to make sure that people don't misinterpret what we're doing so the little red bar says Digital Earth Australia Water Bodies shows the wet surface area of water bodies as estimated from satellites. It does not show depth, volume, purpose of the water body, nor the source of the water. So we're really being very upfront and open about trying to tell people that you can't make compliance decisions. You can't 
say someone's done something illegal based off this tool. This is just one tool that goes into a complete toolkit that gets you that compliance story. So um, there's been a lot of intentional messaging added with this product because obviously it's a very contentious issue. It's a system that's incredibly dry. There's a lot of polit politics that comes around it um, and there's a lot of community um, interest in making sure that the water is shared fairly because there's such a small amount of it. So um, yes, we've done some really intentional messaging around that. Um, but that aside, we're actually now moving to try and get to that volume piece. So we're combining um, the water extents from Landsat um, with LiDAR data, which gives you a DEM, and we're going to start trying to map between changes in surface area and changes in volume. And what that'll tell you is if you've got a cube storage, your uncertainty is nearly 100% because you just can't tell the volume of water from a cube um, yep. from space. It just looks like a square. Um, so we'll be able to put some kind of uncertainty bounds around that and pretty much say this particular storage, you can see where it goes empty and you can see where it starts to have water in it, but we really can't say more than that. So that's the next stage is to start to put some extra uncertainty bounds around that volume estimation. Got it. Um, so Ben, is, 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 I, think, I think it's a similar take on this question is, are there thoughts on expanding it to estimate the volume? And you, you just answered that. So yeah, I think that's good. Great. Well, look, thank you very much, Claire. We've got thank one you. more presentation. So um, let's shift over to Gabriel Sene, who's going to talk about modeling water consumption through evapotranspiration. All right, can you see? Yep. Can you hear me? We've got your screen. Can you see that? Yep, your presentation you looks good. It's good? All right. All right, thanks. thanks. Um, so, and time is short, so I'll run quick. So it's all about using um, EVA satellite data, Earth observation data for evapotranspiration and uh, modeling and monitoring. Uh, this, um, Pete said this mainly focus on the domain part of the data science. I like to acknowledge a strong team at Eros, also in collaboration from DRI on Google Cloud Computing, and some Panjo computing here. If there is a Panjo question, so just a bit of uh, eating remote system, but also some applications globally at regional scale. What I'm going to be talking about uh, where we in a combination of operation and transpiration. Um, well, one thing is evapotranspiration, about 65% of precipitation ends up being returned to the atmosphere globally. The US is about 70%. And why we're interested in that is um, some of us, like uh, domestic water use industries, are really interested in runoff. But how much runoff, how much water we get in rivers and lakes depends on how much is evapotranspiration, because generally a lot of happens after we meet the needs of the soil, which is the needs of the plant, of the process before the rivers and lakes. So that's very important. And there is a huge spatial temporal variability of evapotranspiration, which affects how much water we get in rivers and lakes, in addition to, of course, you know, the amount of water we need to grow crops. So as an example, I'm just going to show you the difference between a precipitation, which is a main driver of uh, hydrology, which is a uh, Mississippi River Basin, and high precipitation in here, lower precipitation. Now I'm going to contrast it with how evapotranspiration highly variable in space. And both of them are annual time scale. As you can see, evapotranspiration varies in space heavily, and that's because it depends on soil moisture and the vegetation cover. That's why understanding vegetation cover change, uh, working with terrain soil and, and you know, LC map with just we're trying to understand how land cover change affects uh, the evapotranspiration, which will affect the runoff and the stream flow. Um, so in terms of really data science and you know how evapotranspiration fits, um, I try to summarize in these three bullets. Uh, one, as I said, ET uh, varies um, in space and time. That would depend on soil moisture and vegetation. So it's, this is a domain aspect of uh, the data science. Um, but you know, uh, satellite data gives us, uh, makes it possible uh, to cover large areas. The understanding of ET is more than 50 years. All science, very mature. 
uh, understanding is one thing, but mapping it at a larger area globally is another thing. So before satellite data, it was impossible to do that. Uh, but with satellite data, we know it is a huge amount of data, and we need uh, um, investment in computation. Now that's why you know with computer science and informatics and cloud computing, it's possible to do this globally. Um, so one application is, you know, as you said, just satellite data is great equalizer. What I mean by that is just anywhere in the world, we have the same uh, quality remote sensing data that can be used for environmental monitoring. So uh, we have a project, this is Eros, by the way, those of you who have been to Eros in South Dakota, and where we uh, manage and operate Landsat uh, satellites. Now we have Landsat 8, Landsat 9 is coming. And one of the projects where I start working is a FAM early warning system, this monitoring uh, especially developing countries. And since 1985, we use a lot of satellite data to monitor uh, through what we call convergence of evidence. Uh, this is satellite derived rainfall, for example, in Zimbabwe below normal, and this is evapotranspiration uh, below normal and NDVI below normal. If three independently acquired observations from satellite point to a drought condition, we stand have that conditions. So where is it now in terms of global monitoring? Uh, we are we we model now the whole world and in this case one scale and we convert them to a house. Um, and then here is for example last year this annual total ET. As you can see Australia, I hope you know Alex you guys probably verify what happened here. Just generally very below normal and also much Russia. But the U.S. was generally above normal last year. But uh, looking at the most recent, uh, from March to July, first, the first 10 days of July, um, again, the northern, it is a northern hemisphere growing season. There is again another drought uh, emerging here. So when drought happens back to back, you know, it's impact on crop production. And we also do it month by month. This is June of last month. What you see what's happening here, some dry conditions in part of the US. India is pretty good, but again, you know, there's a lot of drought condition in here. I think that's probably Kazakhstan. So how do we estimate ET and you know uh, where we are also with a high resolution? Uh, we monitor, you know, where is the, the role of satellite data in here? Satellite data is pretty much a data provider. You need a domain science, in this case, for example, agronomic uh, knowledge. The satellite gives us a temperature, land surface temperature from Landsat to geostationary satellites, or we can get precipitation data from satellites as well. Um, and here, for example, in the USGS, water available in the youth program, uh, or water smart or water census, funds us to um, estimate ET at a sub county scale. And one of the models we use is called CBAB, uh, Simplified Surface Energy Balance Operational Model. Uh, in this model, what we do is a land surface temperature from land satin here. Uh, the, the, the gradient in land surface temperature is uh, from, for example, here up to 30 degrees centigrade or Kelvin. And this is a cooler surface are irrigated and these are less irrigated areas. So that temperature gradient is a measure of evaporative cooling. Or which is so I'm going to contrast this with how much ET. So well irrigated areas we use a lot more water, and then they, they appear cooler, and that's how we estimate developer transpiration. There is a model in here that combines, of course, weather data and land surface temperature from the satellite. Um, and because of huge amount of data, the only way we can cover the whole you know, U.S. or the world is now by going through cloud computing. And in here uh, we collaborate with uh, DRI to implement the model in an earth engine environment. Um, so a multi protocol of an ET, um, where you know, as of now about six ET models are working together to create an ensemble and hoping the ensemble is better than the models or some models are performing in some areas and other areas. This is one of the first ever uh, corners wide, uh, US wide, uh, 30 meter resolution evapotranspiration at annual time scale. This is a, a 10 year average. Um, and this is only happening in a, in a, in a Google Earth Engine cloud computing uh, platform. It takes about 16,000 images to produce an annual ET. It takes about two to three days to process this in GE. And once you have the data, of course, we can zoom into different crop fields or wetland areas and have a better hydrology understanding. 
And this is an important slide, I think, to see, you know, why we go for our campaign. For example, one scene that would used to take about 10 minutes because with cloud computing less than a minute. If you look at processing in all the US, um, probably more than two years, probably we will finish it, something breaks down, but now within you know, two, three days or just within a week, we can complete this. There's also another advantage of uh, working on a cloud. Um, with desktop processing, you know, we had to put so much data, 10 terabytes with our data, but now everything is on the cloud, there's no, nothing. So only outputs with the cloud computing. We don't worry about inputs, uh, only outputs. Um, we, we do the same thing with uh, what we call the vegetative water balance approach. Uh, as we have in the model, which is we need precipitation, which is soil information and atmospheric demand, what we call potentiality. All that goes now in a, a Pangeo cloud uh, computing environment where uh, Tony Butzer is helping us. Um, he said, I pretty much set up a computer in the cloud, and we have buckets, and we have buckets for inputs, we have buckets for outputs. And the advantage of cloud computing is now we can parameterize, improve the model performance. Before, we just hope, uh, well, I hope it's just on an average, it's good. But now with cloud computing, we can go and check every point, and we are not afraid of reparameterizing the model because we can get the results uh, quicker in a state of months. Uh, with a number of times, an application of, for example, the veggie model and a daily 250 meters. Uh, without this, we would not be able to run 250 for the cones. Um, so inputs come in from precipitation to NDPI to air temperature and there are various outputs with the model. This is an example of just an application, what we are trying to do in here. This is just a growing season in part of Delaware. What you see in the blue line is the expected water requirement of a crop and the blue line and the green is what's really being achieved because of rainfall. As you can see in here, there was a dry spill and the actual ET was less than what required. And this is an area where irrigation needs to be applied. So we can estimate how much irrigation is being applied. And with land cover change from one to another, we can project in the future how much would be the irrigation requirement. Uh, so if you run the same model now, this is for irrigated areas in the Delaware River Basin from for 17 years from 2000 to 2016. We plan to go back to earlier and to the future as well. You can see that you know the irrigation amount uh, varies from a wet year up to 10% to a drier year up to 33%. So at least it just gives you the amount of irrigation needed and now and in the future and the impact of land cover change on the water resources. Um, this is what I have as recommended probably. Again, I know you're short of time. Um, I will stop right in here and uh, give you a chance for some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriel. It's a really interesting presentation. Um, I wonder how the work that you're doing will be supported by the global release of um, uh, the Landsat Collection 2 and, and will this Will this enable the kind of cloud computing that you're doing in platforms outside of Google Earth Engine? I mean, at that global scale? Yes, um, we are actually looking forward to the collection two release. Um, what we found out is one, actually it has a, a better accuracy than the land surface temperature we produce uh, because of the special emissivity parameters uh, calculations they do. So, um, and it will be available on all cloud environment. My understanding, of course, I think primarily on Amazon Web Service, and we're hoping this would be available on the on Google as well. But within Amazon Web Service as well, we plan to implement our model on um, uh, on the Pangeo platform as well. So we're looking forward to that. I think it's expected to be released in September, October. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, great. Um, so, any other questions from from folks? I'm not seeing any specific ones at the moment. So, what we might um, what we might do here is open up to uh, a panel session. So, we've got about ten minutes left. Uh, now, I have a question here that hasn't yet been answered from the attendees for Robbie. So I might switch over to this one. 
Uh, Robbie, what's your thoughts on replicating a similar application, so the coastline application over low-lying countries and regions where sea level is a big threat to coastlines? Um, yeah, um, I did put that answer in the, um, in the chat. It didn't come across the Q and A, but um, essentially everything about our method can be translated to anywhere globally. So we use a global tide model for all of our tide modeling. Um, so that that essentially applies in any coastal location, um, and using open access um, EO data. So theoretically, everything about our method can be applied um, to another location. Um, and we are in sort of preliminary um, discussions and seeing if we can um, get up a, a sort of a case study area in Africa. Um, there's some really extremely eroding coasts in West Africa, particularly um, right. potentially as part of the CEOS Coast Initiative or on Digital Earth Africa. Um, so it's all, we haven't got anything concrete, um, but there's definitely some places that we're still in, in for applying it. Great. Cool. Um, I don't see any other questions from the um, audience, but what about panelists? Does it, do any of the panelists have questions for each other? I'm sure there's some curiosity around in between us all. Uh, this is just, I'll ask oh, a question of Robbie, if that's okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, you were just to follow up on the, you know, the, the Africa example that you were talking about with coastal erosion. Do you, and, and you talked about how important the um, temporal uh, aspect of Landsat was to your process. Do you think that, um, you know, Africa is sort of, uh, you know, has much less uh, data available, Landsat data sort of historically. Do you think that that will, um, you know, how do you think that will function in, in your technique or, yeah. or cause problems? Will cause problems. <laughs> yeah, so it definitely will cause problems, um, particularly in equatorial Africa, where you you can be lucky to get a handful of clear images across a full year. Um, it does get better in um, in the more recent record. Um, so I think if there was a product for an area of Africa, it probably would be focused on the most recent decade, probably rather than thirty years, um, because that's sort of where we get. We we still need roughly. Um, about five or six clear images in the right tidal range to get a good result. Um, Cause that gives you enough images that you can sort of combine the data and sort of get rid of all of the, the noisy pixels. So sort of get rid of the effects of white water, get rid of the effects of stray clouds that haven't been masked properly. Um, and there's always possibility that it may not be, and you don't necessarily have to do an annual product. You could do like a three year composite rather than a one year composite. Um, and then if you perhaps combined it with Sentinel-2 data, you might start to get the, the, the amount of data you need, but yeah, the amount of pixels you get, good clean pixels you get in one year is definitely a limit of the technique. If you can threshold Sentinel-1 and identify water, there's no reason why you couldn't use that data as well, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And we have done some um, some small experiments with Sentinel-1, and um, it does work quite well. Um, you can sort of, as long as you can get a, a water line out of it, um, essentially you can still, you can create a composite of Sentinel-1 data instead and do a, a, an extracted waterline from a sort of an annual one year period of Sentinel-1. Um, so sort of, I mean, the, the ultimate sort of, this could be a, a composite product of all sorts of different EO data. Um, you just need something that you can convert to a, a layer that you can then extract a waterline from. Um, yeah, so definitely. And Belle, I think you had a question. Yeah, I did um, for Gabrielle. I, and I'm sorry if I missed this, the connection here was a bit shaky at some points, but um, I'm curious about the crop area mapping with the evapotranspiration and um, I, you mentioned um, land surface temp using land surface temperature for that. I uh, just wondering if you can go a little bit more into um, how you defining the cropping areas and expected. Um, oh, oh, okay. Growth. We're using, we're using a crop area map produced already oh. to summarize or ETI. Yeah, yeah. No, we were not okay. using it for. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks. We're just using it to define. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I think I think what we might do then is wrap up here. Um, this is your last call. Final call. You have a couple of minutes. And then we're going to close things down. But look, I want to thank all of our panelists, presenters for some really fantastic presentations.
quite diverse, but all demonstrating the power of analysis ready data and being able to uh, undertake analyses of vast quantities of data. And, and I think that this work is going to be made uh, just more easy, um, more accessible to other folks by getting all of this data and the global Landsat data being available on the cloud is going to be a huge enable, I think. So look, let's wrap it up there. So thank you very much for your time presenters. Thank you very much for attending audience. Dave, do you have something that you wanted to? Uh, I, I was just going to thank yourself and Tony for setting, setting this up and all the hard work you did, making sure all the technology worked and for some sublime ceremony mastering that you've done today. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Tony. Dave, and definitely need to acknowledge Tony Butzer as well. Absolutely. Thanks, Tony. Um, great. Well, that's the end. So thank you very much and um, keep an ear out for future in initiatives like this one. All right. Great job, Alex. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.